Once they moved into apartment number 14, Jody sensed something dark inside the place. It's believed that a spirit still haunts the place. This paranormal entity wants justice for the crimes committed back in the 1970s. And it all started with a woman named Maria Elizabeth Spanicky. So once he clamped down the box and locked it, the head would be completely sealed inside. The inside was also lined with insulation so nobody could hear anyone scream. Then she began having a recurring nightmare of a dark dungeon. Here they buried Marlissa's body. Cameron then burned all of her clothes and belongings. Coming from Hannah's closet was the sound of Hannah's sleep and snore Ernie doll. I feel great! I feel great! I feel great! But soon enough, he needed another slave. But this time, he would keep her for seven years. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. Joined in the studio by my co-host, Austin. What up? How's it going, man? And then we've got Daniel behind the scenes over there, the producer. Hey, everybody. And boy, do we have a very, very disturbing case for you today. And this one is especially intriguing because there's like multiple elements to this. So there's there's the element of a, a missing girl whose spirit ends up sort of haunting the apartment that she lived in, which ultimately may have led clues to you know, her case being solved, which is really interesting, especially going from last week where we were talking about a killer that was haunted by his victim's spirit. But this is kind of a, a little bit different. Two weeks ago. Oh, two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. And time's just flying by. I can't <laughs> keep track of anything anymore. I actually came across this case after watching the episode of Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix ghost in apartment 14 and i was so intrigued by it i wanted to know more because i know oftentimes with unsolved mysteries episodes they really just kind of like scratch the surface right yeah they glossed over kind of so much the parallel case right this one right they kind of like mentioned it because there's also another victim a part of this case colleen stan yeah and they really didn't go into her whole whole story either and after diving into it i kind of see why because it's it's deeply disturbing right um what happens in this particular case and so just for a warning this is definitely a a very graphic and just upsetting episode there's a lot of different elements to this that some might find uh, upsetting so this is uh your your warning there because lately we've been getting a lot of people like why don't you get more warnings for stuff but again this is lights out so you should know what you're getting into when you you know click on this episode or, or listen to the show but with that being said, you've been warned, but there's a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to go ahead and just dive right into things. But this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Stamps.com and Every Plate. Also, another way you can support the show that's completely free is just making sure you're subscribed on YouTube, following us on Spotify, or subscribed on Apple Podcasts. It does really help us out. It just takes a minute, and obviously leaving us rating or reviews is also very helpful. We take all your guys' feedback pretty seriously. I mean, we, we really try to improve the show and continue to bring you you know some of the most interesting stories and cases that we can find out there and so far i think we've been doing pretty good this year we've got a lot of really interesting stuff coming down the pipeline it's crazy like we have we we basically keep like a running list of episode ideas and i think we have enough ideas for like the rest of this year yeah i think i counted we had like 60 ideas it's crazy because like every day dude i'm like i come across something like we got to cover this we got to cover that and i'm like we just with one episode a week, we only have so many episodes we can do every year. Right. And I mean, we got content for years to come. Oh yeah. So this is the show to subscribe to. If you want a show that covers paranormal, we cover true crime, but we cover some of the darkest topics out there and cases out there. So if that's, if that's something you're, you're into, then make sure you're following and subscribe to us. We really appreciate it. But with that being said, let's just go ahead and dive into this one. Our story today begins with the Villas apartment complex that sits on Parmac Road in Chico, California. In recent years, the apartment complex has been renamed and renovated multiple times, and every apartment has also been renumbered. But why? 
Many don't realize that one of these apartments used to be home to a woman who vanished decades ago. It's believed that a spirit still haunts the place. This paranormal entity wants justice for the crimes committed back in the 1970s. And it all started with a woman named Marie Elizabeth Spanicky. Marie was born on June 20th, 1956 in Cleveland, Ohio. She went by the nickname Marliz, a combination of her first and middle names, Marie and Elizabeth. And that's the name we'll be referring to her as throughout this episode. Marliz was one of seven children, including her older sister, Martha. Marliz was a friendly, outgoing, and beautiful woman. She was known as the most creative of all of her siblings. She loved the arts, especially music and sculpture. In 1975, Marliz worked with a 25-year-old guy named John Joseph Baruth. John was originally from California, and Marliz's mother later described him as a, quote, hoodlum and a drug dealer. But he and Marliz ended up falling in love. That year, Marliz had just graduated from high school, and John was planning on moving back to California when he asked Marliz to move in with him. She agreed, so the two relocated to Chico, California in late 1975. And the couple moved into what is now the villa's apartment complex and lived in what used to be apartment number 14. John had started community college at Butte College. Meanwhile, Marliz got a part-time job working as a model at a local camera shop. But she had bigger dreams of becoming an actress. And she hoped to find full-time work. But Marliz had trouble adjusting to the move. Her life in California didn't match up with the hopes and dreams that she had. Marliz wrote her sister a letter and said she didn't like it there. She was getting into fights with John more often and she didn't make any new friends after moving. She was lonely and she had nowhere to turn. Only after two months of living in Chico, she wrote to her sister and said she wanted to move back to Cleveland in April of that year, 1976. But she still had big dreams for her future. She wanted to get a college degree, eventually settle down and get married. But sadly, she would never do any of these things. On January 31st, 1976, Marliz disappeared when she was only 19 years old. That day around 4 p.m., she and John were at a flea market near East 20th and Mulberry Streets in Chico when the two of them got into a fight, and Marliz stomped off in anger and headed back towards their apartment. She was last seen traveling on foot wearing blue jeans and a sweater. John apparently last saw her walking away from the building down Mangrove Avenue, he later went home, but she wasn't there, so he just figured she had found somewhere else different to stay while she blew off some steam. But when Marliz hadn't returned to the apartment in two days, he contacted the police and reported her missing on February 2nd, 1976. Of course, John was the first person of interest for police, so he was questioned. He even took a polygraph test, but he passed, and they let him go. The investigation quickly dried up, and it seemed like Marliz had just vanished out of thin air. The case went cold quickly by 1977, but multiple friends, family, and armchair detectives still tried cracking the case over the years. The FBI, a private investigator, a psychic, and even an African witch doctor tried to solve Marliz's disappearance, but none of them had any luck. Over seven years passed, and in 1984, the police got a potential break in the case. On November 7, 1984, a woman named Janice Hooker sat down in a confessional booth at a church in Red Bluff, California. She had a grave sin that she needed to get off her chest. So she confessed to Pastor Dabney. She said that her husband, Cameron Hooker, had kidnapped and killed a teenage girl back in 1976. On top of the confession that her husband killed someone... Janice confessed that she and Cameron had also kidnapped a woman and held her as a sex slave for the past seven years. And this woman's name was Colleen Stan. So I was kind of curious about when you confess to a pastor or a priest if they have some obligation to contact police. And uh, it's weird because it's similar to a HIPAA agreement. A patient-doctor confidentiality agreement exists between priests and their congregation. So there's an actual, like, a like yeah rule behind this yes so a lot of religions um it's called the clergy penitent privilege or the sacramental seal hmm. 
and it actually is protected by civil law most of the time. Uh, it's a legal mechanism that prevents clergy or counselors from being required to disclose confidential communications in a court proceeding. This is meant to protect the person who discloses the information, not the clergy. Um, in a few states, though, there have been exceptions in uh, uh, reporting child sex abuse, especially, or just child abuse in general. But that only applies, I think it's pretty slim. It was only like six states or something even do that. Um, for lots of religions, the law of the church strictly forbids it, but the civil law of these states have statutes to report child abuse. But Others, not murder? Not murder. What? Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. Other circumstances include if the congregant is currently causing harm or planning on causing harm in the future, that is one place where they can, if, if they're someone plotting comes, something, like, yeah, I'm going like, to go murder something someone, up. Or... That's when they can intervene and contact police. Um, because basically the person can sue the pastor or priest which has happened wow actually several times um it's an evasion of privacy and other claims from the disclosure of confidential information by a pastor or other church officials but there are ways kind of around this which i think maybe is what happened here i'm not sure obviously it's all confidential inside the confessional booth but what might have happened in this case is uh, you can withhold absolving someone until they confess their crimes. So basically, you know how you get your your penance or whatever at the end? They say, like, right. do 10 Hail Marys or whatever, yeah. and then you'll be absolved. The, the little bit of a loophole is like a priest could basically be like, in order for you to be absolved of your sins, you, need you have to, to go contact uh, police. So you can kind of like nudge them in the right direction. Right. So then it's up to them. they're going and saying yep. it. And it's not the clergy. It's not the clergy. Yep. Interesting. I, I never even knew that. Honestly, I knew that like psychiatrists and, you know, counselors, things like that had yeah. sort of that rule, but I didn't know that clergy did too. Yeah. It's basically the same thing. They could be sued. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy though for murder. I mean, it, it makes you wonder like over the years, how many people have like gone to confessional and confessed to murdering somebody and nothing was ever done. Yeah. And those murders potentially never get solved because the clergy can't say anything about it. Right. Cause I guess, I guess they could be lying too. True. So there's always like the it could liability be, that comes along with that. But it's like somebody comes to you and is like, yeah, we did this. And is it, especially if they explain it in great detail and you can't do anything about it. I mean, it came in, how does a priest even deal with that? What do you even do? Yeah. They're just like, how do you well, carry that around knowing that you have this information that could potentially help a family like but yet you can't say anything about it right that's that's crazy to me that's why i think that a lot of them try to use that loophole with like you need to go tell police i can't because my hands are bound by this weird canon law and church right. law and which it's technically also a civil law too wow because you know the state protects church rights you know yeah i feel like that's that's one that might need to change yeah right? for sure like, i agree i just yeah i don't know i don't know if that's quite the same as a mental health professional a clergy i don't know i think that's that's just like an old old school rule or something yeah after her confession to her pastor officer al shamblin from the red bluff police department was called to the church of nazarene when he arrived he saw janice sitting across from pastor dabney janice was extremely emotionally upset and she confessed everything to the pastor. She had been terrified of her husband, Cameron, but her guilt had finally overcame her fear. When she began to confess, Officer Al Shamblin realized that the information might incriminate herself, so he quickly read off her Miranda rights. After he did that, she got scared and said she no longer wanted to talk without an attorney. Al then called the district attorney's office and gave them all the information he had. Janice was then granted full immunity in exchange for her testimony against her husband. Her story began when she first met Cameron Hooker. Janice had met Cameron when she was only a teenager. Cameron was born November 5, 1953 in Altoras, California to Harold and Lorena Hooker. From an early age, his family moved around constantly so his father could find work in construction or a local lumber mill. 
When Cameron was 15, his family finally settled down in Red Bluff. As a teen, he didn't stand out at all and mostly kept to himself, but he often fantasized about tying up women and having his way with them. Through his teenage years, he became obsessed with dominating women and having them as sex slaves. After graduation, he got a job like his father in a local lumber mill. In school and at work, he kept to himself and rarely talked to anyone. In April 1973, he was introduced to Janice, who went by Jan. She was a young girl who suffered from epilepsy, and he thought he had found the perfect person to take control of. When they met, Jan was only 15 years old, and Cameron was 19. He treated her with kindness and manipulated her into thinking he was a great guy. Once she trusted him, he brought up his interest in bondage. And one day, he asked her if he could tie her up in a tree. She agreed because she thought this was just a kink that could play out safely. So he took her out to the woods and then tied her up by the wrists to a tree. Janice thought it was painful, but she said Cameron treated her with love and care after the bondage session. She wanted to make him happy, so she kept agreeing to the bondage sessions two or three times a month. Eventually, things escalated to whipping her and dunking her head into water until she almost was unconscious. Even though the sexual violence got worse, she thought it was the only way to keep him happy. And when they weren't doing their intense BDSM sessions, he was the nicest guy she would ever meet. So she suffered through it in order to make the relationship last. Eventually, Janice lied to Cameron and told her that she was pregnant so he would propose. And he did. On January 18, 1975, they married in Reno, Nevada. Janice was only 16 years old, but her parents gave them permission. After, she dropped out of school. After they got married, they then found a rental back in Red Bluff, California, and they settled down. They seemed like a normal couple to neighbors from the outside, but inside the house, Cameron continued to escalate their intense BDSM sessions. He began choking her until she passed out. And whenever they fought, he threatened to kill her. The final straw was Cameron strapping a sealed gas mask to her face and nearly choking her to death. She finally stood up for herself and said she would no longer tolerate the abuse. So instead of Janice being the target of Cameron's fantasies, they both decided they would find another outlet. And that outlet was Marie Elizabeth Spanicky. At first, Cameron thought about placing an ad in the back of one of his favorite porn magazines, but he thought that that would only be a temporary fix. Eventually, he convinced Janice that they should kidnap a woman in order to make her a sex slave. And to make the deal happen, he promised Janice a baby if she helped him kidnap a woman. So Janice agreed, as she wanted a child more than anything, and this would get him to redirect his violent fantasies towards another woman. The one condition was that Cameron couldn't have sex with a woman. He could only perform his sadistic acts on their slave. But if he wanted to have sex, he would only be able to have sex with Janice. They then found a new rental house at 1140 Oak Street in Red Bluff. It was small, but it had a basement that was perfect for their BDSM room. He gathered up some scrap wood from the lumber mill and constructed a table he called the rack. He installed eye hooks to the table so the slave could be bound to the top. This was also when he built his infamous head box. This head box was a handmade double walled wooden box, weighed around 20 pounds. If you ever see a picture of it, it's, it's wild, it looks very disturbing. There were these metal hinges on the very top. So once he clamped down the box and locked it, the head would be completely sealed inside. The inside was also lined with insulation and carpeting so nobody could hear anyone scream. That was, that was kind of the point. It would be, it kept the victim silent and it also kept them disoriented because there was no light inside. You had no idea what was going on. You couldn't hear anything. So it was basically just Probably to difficult keep them, to breathe. Dude. Yeah. Especially if the neck hole wasn't big enough, which we'll see later. One of the victims, like, he didn't, he cut the neck hole a bit too small. So it was like low key choking them. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, that's horrible. Once Cameron and Janice were ready to find their victim, they both got into the blue 1971 Dodge Colt on January 31st, 1976. And it didn't take them long before they spotted a 19-year-old Marliz walking down Mangrove Avenue in Chico. 
Cameron circled around the block a few times, making sure the coast was clear, and then they pulled over beside Marla's and offered her a ride. The couple seemed nice, so she agreed, and they let her into the back seat of their blue 1971 Dodge Colt. Once they got her settled into the back seat, he started asking Marla's questions about herself and learned that she had just moved to the area. Then he learned that she didn't have any family or friends in town, and her relationship with her boyfriend was rocky. No one knew where she was currently, and Cameron thought nobody would be looking for this girl. He realized that he had found the perfect target. At one point, Marliz became uncomfortable and tried to get out of the car, and said she wanted to walk the rest of the way home. But Cameron hopped out of the car, grabbed her, and put a knife to her throat, and then yanked her back inside. Once he got her into the back seat, he forced the head box on her. From there, they brought her back to their house in Red Bluff, California, which is about a 40-mile drive. And once they arrived at the property, they drove the car into the one-car garage near the back of the house. Janice went inside for a few minutes while Cameron stayed inside the garage. When Janice returned, she noticed Marliz on the ground in a disoriented state, and she could smell something in the air. Janice asked what had happened, and Cameron confessed that he had sprayed starting fluid into a rag and forced it over Marliz's mouth until she was semi-unconscious. The two of them then carried her into the basement, and this is when the horrible torture began. Cameron was fascinated with sexual violence and dominance, but he hated when they screamed. According to Janice, he studied how to surgically remove a person's vocal cords, and once Marliz regained some strength, the screaming began. So Cameron hauled her up to the bathroom and asked Janice for help but Janice refused to help cut her vocal cords. Cameron then threatened Janice, saying he would do the same thing to her if she didn't help. So she sat down next to Marliz on the bathroom floor. Cameron then took out a knife and began cutting through Marliz's neck in order to reach her vocal cords. But he had no idea what he was doing. Blood began pulsing out of her neck wound, and he soon realized that he was in way over his head, and there was no way he could cut her vocal cords out. So they put pressure on the wound to stop the bleeding and carried her back down to the basement. According to Janice, Cameron was alone with Marliz for a while, downstairs. She finally went down sometime later, and once she was down there, she saw Marliz naked and hanging from the ceiling. A white pillowcase covered her head. According to Janice, Cameron had shot Marliz in the stomach with a pellet gun, strangled her, and then tied the noose through one of the eye hooks in the basement ceiling joist, and hung her there. By the time she got down there, Marliz was already dead. Around 2 a.m., they dragged her body back out to the car and placed her remains in the trunk. They both got in the car while Cameron hopped in the driver's seat. They then drove a half hour up to Redding and then took Highway 44 East towards Lassen Park. They turned off on an isolated dirt road where Cameron dug a shallow grave. Here they buried Marliz's body. Cameron then burned all of her clothes and belongings. The entire kidnapping, murder, and burial took place in just 10 to 12 hours. Months later, Cameron and Janice had their first child charity, just like Cameron promised her. For a moment, it looked like Cameron's fit of violence was over, but soon enough, he needed another slave. But this time, he would keep her for seven years. Now that summertime is right around the corner, start saving your penny so that you can do some fun stuff this summer, go on vacation, you know, go to the movies and let every plate take care of the grocery shopping for you. Did you know that every plate is actually 25% cheaper than going to the grocery store? For those that don't know, HelloFresh actually owns every plate and every plate is the budget meal kit, but it doesn't sacrifice quality. I know a lot of people's adverse reactions to meal kits is the fact that they think they're expensive. Well, every plate is as cheap as $1.49 per meal, believe it or not. Pretty much since the beginning of the year, I've been strictly only doing meal kits from every plate and my god has my life gotten so much easier i don't have to grocery shop i save tons of money and the food is absolutely delicious and it's great because it's all pre-portioned so it actually helps with my portion control so i don't overeat which has been uh, super helpful this year to helping myself get back in shape every plate changes up the recipes weekly and it all comes in a neat box right to your doorstep if you haven't tried every plate stop what you're doing right now and give them a try I promise you won't be disappointed. Get $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code lightsout149. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal 
by going to everyplay.com slash podcast and entering code LIGHTSOUT149. That's up to a $110 value, so take advantage today. Colleen Martin was born December 31st, 1956 in Riverside, California to Jack and Evelyn Martin. She had two younger sisters. Her parents divorced when she was young, but they stayed close so that she could visit both of them. Growing up, she was creative and often wrote poetry and handmade gifts for her friends. She dropped out of high school when she was 16 and got married in Carson City, Nevada, with her father's permission. She was married on December 12, 1973, to a man named Tim Stan. She'd only known him for a few months. They then moved to his home state of Ohio, but their marriage failed after only one year. They separated and Colleen returned to Riverside where she got her GED. But she struggled to find her own way in life. She later became friends with a woman named Alice Walsh, her boyfriend Bob and their two-year-old son, Tomac, and together they decided to move to Eugene, Oregon. They struggled to make money there, but they managed to make ends meet. On May 19, 1977, 20-year-old Colleen was on her way to surprise a friend, Linda Smith, for her birthday. She had hitchhiked from Eugene, Oregon, about 350 miles north of Red Bluff, and she was on her way to Westwood, California, about 80 miles east. She was an experienced hitchhiker, and she had done it several times and knew how to spot a safe ride. But when Cameron and Janice Hooker approached her on the I-5 overpass that evening, her senses failed her. The first thing she noticed was that the couple was traveling with a baby, their new baby Charity. So Colleen figured, hey, this would be safe, right? And hitchhiking was really common back in the 70s and 80s. But little did she know this was actually a common tactic for rapists or kidnappers, especially ones that had a wife or girlfriend who was willing to participate. Because a hitchhiker is way more likely to get into a car if they see that it's a couple especially if they have a child with them. It's like, oh, this, nothing they can must go be wrong safe. here. They must right? be good people. They have right. a kid. Yeah. And even earlier in that day, she had already turned down a ride from a group of men and another driver that seemed suspicious. So she thought she had a good read uh, on yeah, people. on hitchhiking. So, and she had taken several rides even to get to where she was because it was quite a long journey. I mean, this wasn't her first rodeo either. Even during one of the rides, she got into a semi-truck and there were two drivers and one of the drivers tried to, while the other one was sleeping or something, they tried to like kiss her and stuff. So she had been in weird situations before. And she was still willing to hitchhike? God. Right. But it was pretty common, like you said. I mean, people did it all the time. Yeah, so. and I mean, she did it enough. Like she got hundreds of miles in already, so... And then she figured she sees this car with a couple and a baby. She's like, actually, this is probably nicer probably than the, the best other ones. ride I'm going to get. Yeah. God. Meanwhile, just getting into a car with some monsters. Yep. After accepting the ride from them, Colleen got into their car. At that point, she had no idea how much her life was about to change. They headed east on Highway 36, but she started feeling uncomfortable when Cameron kept eyeing her through the rearview mirror. Then he began asking her personal questions. He asked her where she was from, how old she was, and if she was married. She answered all the questions honestly, and when he asked her where she was headed, she said she was going to surprise her friend for her birthday. Then Cameron asked, so she doesn't know you're coming? And she answered no. Once again, Cameron found another perfect victim. Eventually, Cameron had to stop for gas, and Colleen went to use the restroom. When she returned, she noticed a strange wooden box in the back seat where she had been sitting. Janice was in the front seat holding her daughter Charity. And this was when Colleen started to sense danger. But she figured she was really close to Westwood, so, you know, she just tried to deal with it until she got there and tried to relax. By the time they were 40 miles to Westwood, Janice asked if it would be okay to check out some local ice caves nearby in the Cascade Mountains. So Colleen agreed. But she stayed in the car while the couple took their baby and headed towards a creek away from the country road. Moments later, Cameron returned alone, and he held a butcher knife in his hand. He then pinned Colleen down in the back seat and put the knife to her neck. He handcuffed her hands behind her back, and then he put a blindfold over her eyes and a gag in her mouth. As she lied down in the back seat of the car, helpless, she was about to find out what that strange wooden device was for. Cameron then clamped the box down over her head and the neck hole pinched down on her throat. He then covered her in a sleeping bag, 
she'd been traveling with so no one would see her through the windows. Janice and Charity then returned to the car and all of them headed back towards Red Bluff. Strangely, they didn't go directly home. At some point, they stopped for a short picnic and Cameron unlocked the head box for a moment so Colleen could eat. But then he put it back on her until they returned to the house. Once they were home, he carried her down the stairs and forced her to stand on a small Coleman cooler. She was up high enough for Cameron to lock one hand to an eye hook he had installed in the ceiling. Then he removed all of her clothes and bound both her hands to the eye hooks in the ceiling before kicking the cooler out from under her. So she was hanging from the ceiling. With her arms straight above her head, she began to have difficulty breathing. This is actually one of the most severe methods of crucifixion with the arms straight above the victim's head. And it can even kill someone within 10 to 30 minutes because it's basically the wrists are then supporting all the body weight and there's so much pressure on the lungs and the chest that they just can't breathe so they'll suffocate and uh people otherwise like if people are crucified with their arms outwards they can survive up to 24 hours so because your lungs are still got full capacity at that point exactly yeah when they're straight up like this yeah it's like it's just crushing your chest So either Cameron just had no idea what he was doing when he tied her up there and Colleen was just this test subject or what I think is that he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew how to tie victims in certain ways to to get that sadistic pleasure out of it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's clear just from the fact that he had this head box that he was like doing research and right. he was trying to come up with all these different torture methods. By this point, Colleen thought that Cameron was going to rape her She was blindfolded and had no idea what was going on. But she was surprised when she heard Janice come back downstairs along with him. And then the couple began having sex on the table he had built. Colleen could barely breathe and she tried to tilt her head back to look around the room. When Cameron noticed, he got up from the table, grabbed a leather whip, and snapped it across Colleen's back. He gave her several more lashings and told her to stop moving. She had to learn how to withstand the pain and not react to it. Once she stopped moving, he put a small wooden box beneath her feet. It wasn't large enough to fully stand on, and she could only push herself up slightly with her toes and take a few deep breaths. When he finished having sex with Janice, he put the cooler under Colleen's feet and unhooked her from the ceiling, and then he forced her into a wooden crate where he chained her ankles to one end and her hands to the other, and then he also put the head box back on her. The neck hole at the bottom of the box was slightly too small for her neck, so there was always constant pressure on her throat, and then he tied a cord around her waist, making it even more difficult for her to breathe, and this became her first night in captivity, the first of thousands. By the next morning, Cameron removed her from the wooden crate and placed her on the table. He bound her hands and legs to the eye hook screwed into the table. He left her there naked for hours with the head box still on. Later in the day, Cameron and Janice came downstairs and removed the head box, but they made her keep the blindfold on. They then fed her a bowl of potatoes and a glass of water. When she was finished, they offered her a bedpan to relieve herself. Cameron then bound her wrist to the ceiling, and when he finished having sex with Janice, she bound Colleen to the table and left her there for the night. The next day, he offered her an egg salad sandwich and a glass of water, but this time, she refused the food, which just made Cameron very angry as he felt that she wasn't grateful. So he bound her and whipped her until she passed out from the pain. When she came to, she was on the table again, and the sandwiches sat in front of her. Even though she still didn't have an appetite, she forced down the sandwiches. This was a strategy Cameron used to break her down. Little by little, he would make her realize that she would have to do everything he commanded her to do. Again, Cameron fixed the head box to her and left her on the table, and this became the daily routine. By May 21st, Colleen was supposed to be back in Eugene, Oregon, and her roommate Alice became worried when she didn't return. She tried to get in touch with Colleen's friend Linda, but she didn't have a phone. So she figured Colleen might have gone further south to visit her mom in Riverside. But when she called, her mom said she hadn't seen her either. So by May 25th, Alice contacted the Eugene Police Department and filed a missing persons report. But during the 1970s, as many of us know, the police really had no concern for hitchhikers. Like always, they assumed Colleen had just wandered off on her own. Meanwhile, Colleen was still locked in the basement in Red Bluff, and life went on as usual for the hookers. Cameron would go to work at the lumber mill, and Janice would stay home with the baby. Eventually, he got some free particle board from work, and he brought it home. He was always concerned about the noise Colleen could make, and he worried the neighbors or visitors would hear. 
Since he botched the vocal cord surgery on Marliz, he didn't want to try that again, but he still threatened to cut them out. He then built a sealed wooden box where he could lock Colleen inside. It was six feet by three feet, and he doubled the thickness with two layers of particle board to reduce the sound. Instead of keeping Colleen in the head box all the time, he now kept her locked in a wooden box in the basement. He tied a chain around her neck and tethered her wrists and ankles to the neck chain, and this is how he left her every night. Even though it was better than the head box at first, it started to get too hot inside to the point where she could barely breathe and nearly died. So Cameron drilled holes into the either end of the box and connected a hair dryer to one of the holes. He set it to low, no heat, so a small bit of air ventilated the box. The routine continued, but eventually Cameron grew bored and escalated the violence. Just like he did with Janice, he began strangling Colleen and forcing her head underwater as he found pleasure in watching her come close to death. And it got to the point where Colleen realized that the more she fought back during the torture sessions, the more excited he got. So she tried her best not to react to the pain. After three months had passed, they finally noticed Colleen hadn't had her period. Apparently this was due to stress, so for the first time during her captivity, she had her period and Cameron was furious. She also accidentally relieved herself in the wooden box several times because the one-time bedpan use every day wasn't enough. So after she got her period, she had also been covered with her own urine and feces for months. Cameron sent her upstairs and forced her to take a bath. Janice then tried to brush the knots out of Colleen's hair, but it was too difficult. Instead, she took a pair of scissors and cut her waist-length hair up to her shoulders. Once Colleen was done with the bath, Cameron hogtied her on her stomach and bound a broom handle to her legs. He then placed her in the bathtub, stomach down. The broom handle caught the edges of the tub so her legs stayed up in the air and her head went into the dirty bath water. Cameron waited as the seconds passed. He would only be satisfied when the last air bubbles reached the surface and Colleen would begin writhing in pain. Then he would grab her by the hair and pull her head out of the water. She would only have time for one large gulp of air before he dropped her head back down into the water and he did this for two hours. After he was done with her, he locked her back inside the wooden box. Besides the torture sessions, Cameron realized that he could use Colleen for other things. So he once made her sand a large block of burl, which is a large growth in a deformed tree. These would be sold for a decent price from the lumber mill. He also made her shell nuts before he sold them at the local farmer's market. Colleen was now literally a working slave. As the months passed, Colleen had no idea what the end goal was, and whenever Cameron got bored, the sexual violence would escalate even more. He got more twisted ideas after he read in an underground sex newspaper that some people signed slavery contracts with each other. So he rented a typewriter and he and Janice wrote up a slavery contract for Colleen. He had her write, quote, Michael Powers as a slave master and Janet Powers as the witness. Then he stenciled the word slave contract at the top. On January 25th, 1978, Colleen was working in the small workshop underneath the basement stairs when Cameron approached her. Colleen saw Cameron's face for the first time in nearly eight months, because normally she was always blindfolded, but she was allowed to remove the blindfold while she worked at the workshop. Cameron told her that someone from the company was upstairs, so he had to legally enslave her. He explained that the quote-unquote company was a connection of slave traders who discovered he was keeping an undocumented slave at his property, so he handed over the magazine article that talked about slave contracts. For eight months, Colleen had no access to the outside world, and Cameron had broken her down to the point that she believed slavery was now legal again. Janice had come down to the basement as well and confirmed what Cameron was saying. In the contract, it said things like that she had to maintain her female body parts, never cross her legs in the presence of the master, never wear underwear, and vow that her only source of pleasure would come from her master. She also had to declare her unconditional dedication to serving him. When Colleen asked what would happen if she refused to sign the contract, Cameron said, quote, I'll sign it for you and make you wish you had. After this, she did. Cameron even started making her wear a slave collar. In return, he would give Colleen more freedom around the house, but he told her that the company was surveilling the property and monitoring the phone lines, and if she ever tried to escape, there would be grave consequences. The company would recapture her, torture her, and return her to the house, or they might kill her entire family as payback. Colleen then noticed Janice had a large wound on one of her knees. When she asked what had happened, Cameron told her that Janice was once enslaved, 
She had once tried to escape, but the company found her and tortured her until she almost died. Cameron then found her at one of the company's facilities and she was going to be put to death, but instead Cameron bought her and took her home. He said the wound on her knee was the aftermath of the company torturing her and twisting her legs, and she never fully recovered. But the truth was, Janice just had knee surgery. By now, there might be some listeners wondering why Janice would keep going along with something like this. This is now like eight months into this. She has seen her husband kill someone. I was kind of curious, and there was actually a study done on 20 female accomplices of sexual sadists conducted by Roy Hazelwood and Ann Burgess. And it was actually prompted by this case. The study showed that the male's fantasy life gradually becomes a shared preoccupation. Whatever Cameron wanted ended up motivating both of them. And the strategy for Cameron here is to isolate Janice so she becomes more dependent on him and less able to speak up for herself, which we kind of see this in things like her age. He knew that she was very young at the time. He had a source of income. This is how he develops that dependency. Hazelwood wrote, quote, the ritualistic and heterosexual sadist inherently believes that all women are evil. Consequently, if and when these men set out to prove this hypothesis, they select nice middle-class women who are apparently normal. They use a process that exploits the women's vulnerability to turn her into a compliant accomplice. A professor of psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice thinks that Janice did not have the traits of a psychopath like Cameron did, but she, quote, ceased to have independent thought. So basically, if Janice didn't follow along, Cameron would threaten her life, and he had isolated her to the point that she feared losing his love. So it became the only thing that mattered to her. Plus, if he got a slave and this relationship continued, she would no longer be the focus of abuse if someone else had agreed. So she was into it because she had already seen, you know, she had gone through the the water torture and the, the BDSM. Right. sadism right so she was like this is kind of a she started to believe that this is a win-win for her yeah well and she saw what happened to marliz too right so it's like she's seen all the sides of him right like the absolute worst that he's capable of and so at that point when you feel like there's no chance of escape it's better to accept i guess the circumstances in order to ensure your own safety and then obviously bringing in Colleen probably made her feel good, which is such a weird thing to say in this, these circumstances, but it's hard. It's really hard to like put your mind into the situation and possibly understand how you could become okay with what was happening. But when you've been isolated to this point, I don't think you really have any choice and, and you don't know that there's anything else outside of this anymore. Like this is life right? and this is, just the reality of things yeah you have to figure out the best way to exist for yourself to be okay i guess so yeah and in a sense like what cameron is doing to colleen is kind of what he's already done to janice yeah yeah god after colleen signed the contract cameron renamed her as a letter k a week later cameron showed her a laminated card that said this was her official slave registration Colleen had been so disoriented from the months of torture, abuse, and sensory deprivation, she truly believed that Cameron owned her. The more Cameron broke her, the more she obeyed him. She was then allowed to go to the upstairs part of the house. She cooked and cleaned, and she always referred to Cameron as master, and Janice as ma'am. She was also allowed to use the bathroom, but only if she kneeled and begged for permission. They gave her a nightgown to wear through the house, but if Cameron ever yelled attention, She'd have to strip naked and stand on her tiptoes with her hands on an arched doorway in the house. If she were slow at washing the dishes or not setting the dinner table correctly, Cameron would whip her as punishment. In February 1978, the strange, abusive relationship had taken root between all three of them, and as long as Cameron made Colleen believe she was a slave, he had control over her. Meanwhile, Janice became jealous of the way Cameron looked at Colleen. Janice wanted to test out her relationship with her husband, so she offered to bring Colleen to their bedroom and allow Cameron to have sex with her. Their original deal was that he would never have sex with Colleen. Janice was hoping he would decline, but he sprinted to the basement as fast as he could. 
He forced Colleen into the bedroom and began raping her, and Janice ran into the bathroom and began vomiting. When he heard Janice in the bathroom, Cameron immediately locked Colleen back in the wooden box, and from that day on, Colleen noticed that Janice treated her worse than usual, but now Cameron liked her even more. By April 1978, the couple bought an acre of land and put a small mobile home there. Cameron moved Colleen to the mobile home, and the first time she stepped inside, Cameron showed her a small enclosed area where she would be staying. He'd built it himself. It was a shallow wooden box beneath her waterbed. There was a small panel at the end where Colleen could crawl in and out of. She had the freedom to move around the property, but she was forced to cut the grass and tend to the garden. By this time, Colleen didn't mind the work. She was just happy to be outside. Plus, there was no torture dungeon in the mobile home. There wasn't enough room. But soon enough, Cameron built a small shed on the property, and he made sure to add beams where he could tie up Colleen. After tying her up, he would strip her, whip her, and burn her skin with matches. And over time, like always, he needed to escalate the violence to satisfy his sadistic desires. So he built a stretcher, like a medieval torture device. He would strap her into it and stretch her body until she couldn't feel her hands. One time, he even dislocated her shoulder. Other times, he would strap her to a wooden crossbeam and use an exposed electrical cord to shock her. And soon, Cameron began raping her regularly. By Colleen's third year of slavery, Cameron and Janice had another daughter named Amber. They trusted Colleen enough that she could babysit their two daughters and cook them food. She was also allowed to go jogging on the nearby roads by herself. But if she didn't return in 15 minutes, Cameron threatened to notify the company. He even convinced her that their closest neighbor was a member of the company. One time, another neighbor stopped Colleen while she was running and they got lost in conversation. This made Colleen a few minutes late, so Cameron never let her go running again. But even though she was a few minutes late, Cameron knew she wouldn't run off. She was eventually allowed to go out dancing with Janice or go shopping. Sometimes when Cameron needed some extra cash, he would force Colleen to go out and panhandle. To make even more money, Janice eventually got Colleen a job where she worked, but all the money she made went straight to Cameron. So by this point, we see that Colleen is able to go outside, go into town. And a lot of people would maybe question, well, like, why didn't she just escape then? Why didn't she just catch a bus and leave? But basically at this point, I mean, Cameron had psychologically broken her, right? She was now in full-blown Stockholm Syndrome. The Stockholm bank robbery, where the syndrome got its name, was in 1973. And that was only a few years before Colleen got captured and psychologists believe that this bond is initially created when a captor threatens a captive's life deliberates and then chooses not to kill the captive so then the captive feels this sense of relief and they begin having this false sense of gratitude towards their captor they see them kind of as this benevolent person who spared their life and supposedly it only takes a few days for this to set in wow survival is at the heart of it and the captives become immediately dependent, then they begin seeing even the smallest act of kindness as a good treatment because basically they see the worst of the worst. So right. anything better than that is seen as just this Something gift. positive, even yeah. though it's not positive at all. Right. Wow. More modern studies have connected this to things like domestic violence, cult members, prisoners of war, procured sex workers, and abused children. So it's a lot more common than we think. Um, and so I hope, Nobody at this point thinks in this case like, oh, he's letting her out. She can work a job and whatever. Like she can just go whenever she Why wants. Why doesn't she just call the police? And, right. You know, but tell them everything. And Clearly that's not the case. And he's built up this whole narrative of, quote, the company, that all these people are out there that are watching her every move. And if she does something wrong. So that's a whole other layer because it's, it's like he's extending his control beyond where he is physically right he's creating this invisible boundary that isn't now in her head and is almost worse than what he's been doing to her he's he's like put the fear in her that oh you think i'm bad the company don't let them get a hold of you because it's even worse than what i've been doing it almost makes him look good yes that's how fucked up it is that's crazy to make colleen fear leaving even more Cameron told her a story of a slave contacting police for help, but the officer was a member of the company. He said they punished the slave by amputating her arms and legs, and they cut out her eyes and tongue, 
and then they hung her by her hair in the slave master's bedroom. It was stories like this that made Colleen obey Cameron. She truly believed that obeying Cameron was the only way to survive. On August 6, 1980, the Hooker family went to Chico. Colleen watched the two children while Cameron and Janice went shopping. Cameron even allowed Colleen to call her family, but if she mentioned anything about the slave contract, he would punish her once they got home. He called her family at a gas station and handed her the phone. Colleen's sister Bonnie answered, and Colleen told her that she had been staying with friends. So Bonnie wasn't suspicious at first. Colleen then told Bonnie to tell the rest of the family that she loved them. Before long, Cameron gestured to her that it was time to hang up the phone. After the call, Bonnie could sense hints of trouble from how Colleen talked to her. She didn't say anything specific, but she could hear that something was wrong in her voice. So she went to their father's construction site and told him what had happened. He ended up shutting down the construction site for that day and went home and waited by the phone in case Colleen called again, but she didn't. He then contacted local police and got them to trace the call, but it only led them to a gas station in Chico, which wasn't much help. About three months later, her family received a few letters from her, and luckily, she called them again on Christmas Eve 1980. Her conversations with them were short and lacked detail, so they were concerned, but they were just happy that she was still alive. Many of them were convinced that she had joined a cult, but they couldn't prove it. On Christmas Day, Colleen woke up to a Christmas present from Cameron and Janice. They had bought her a new sleeping bag. For over three years, she had been sleeping in a wooden box with her old sleeping bag, but now they let her sleep in her new sleeping bag in the back room. They still chained her neck to the toilet, but she preferred this over the wooden box. Over the next year, Cameron was less strict with Colleen. She could spend time outside, go jogging, tend the garden, have a job in town, and talk with her family. Colleen called this her year out. But as she got more freedom, her relationship with Janice got worse. Janice hated that Colleen was getting more freedom. So to please his wife, Cameron decided to lock Colleen back up in the box. But first, he wanted to let her visit her family. When he told her she could go, he said that he had gotten permission from the company, but they would be closely watching her. Before leaving, Cameron forced Colleen to say goodbye to the neighbors. He convinced them that Colleen was going back to live with her mother in Riverside. He didn't want them to notice her disappearance once he locked her in the box again. But before he let her visit her family, he locked her in the box for a week straight. He also needed to test her loyalty, so he dragged her out of the box and forced her to kneel in front of him. Then he grabbed his shotgun and told her to place the barrel in her mouth. She followed his orders, and then he commanded her to pull the trigger. She hesitated not knowing if the gun was loaded or not, but like always she knew the only way to survive was to obey Cameron's commands. She placed her finger on the trigger and pulled it. A click went off, but the chamber was empty. She had passed. Cameron's test of loyalty. On March 20th, 1981, he drove her to Riverside to see her family like he had promised, but they first stopped in Sacramento. Cameron pointed out a few office buildings and he said that these were the company's offices. He said she might have to take some tests, so he parked the car and went inside one of the buildings. A few minutes later, he returned and said they were too busy. But all he really wanted to do was reinforce this illusion that the company was real and that Colleen was always being watched. He then handed her a card he claimed was a permit, allowing a slave to carry money. And to keep his cover, he made up a story that he was Colleen's fiancé, Mike, and he was headed to a computer convention in San Diego. He dropped her off and said he would pick her up the next day, and then he stayed in a nearby motel for the night. While she spent time with her family, no one bothered her about where she had been. They noticed her significant weight loss, pale skin, and a new shyness she had never had before. By now, they all believed that Colleen had joined a cult, and they thought if they pried too much, Colleen would get angry and leave them. So they never asked her about it. They were just happy to have her home. Colleen wanted to tell them the truth several times through her visit, but every time she considered it, she thought the company was listening in, and they would torture her and her entire family. By the next day, they all went to church and then over to her aunt's house for lunch. When they got back to her parents' house, Cameron arrived, and he stuck with his story and introduced himself as Mike, Colleen's fiancé. The family even took a picture of the two of them. Colleen can be seen smiling while wrapping her hands around Cameron's shoulders. This picture would later be used against her. But everyone who knew the true story knew Colleen was only trying to play the part to survive. After saying their goodbyes, they headed back to Cameron's mobile home. 
When they returned, the place was empty. Janice had taken the children and stayed with her mother for a bit. Cameron then forced Colleen to shower before raping her and locking her back in the wooden box on March 21, 1981. And for the next three years, she rarely left the box. Cameron only let her out to eat and shower. But even then, she only ate about four or five times a week. If she was out, he would torture and rape her before locking her away again. He tried to keep the rape hidden from his wife, but Janice was still aware of it, and she hated him for it. She urged Cameron to keep Colleen in the box forever. Since Colleen lacked nutrients and sunlight, her skin became pale and her hair began falling out. She had also dropped to 95 pounds. One time, the hookers and their children left for two whole days without leaving her any food or water. When they left again for three days, they only left a jar of water and some cookies. By 1983, Cameron forced Colleen to help him dig a small dungeon in the yard. They installed brick walls, a floor, and a cellar door. This is where he tried to keep her, but it constantly flooded, so she had to stay in the box. After those three horrific years locked away, she slowly regained more freedom again by 1984. Cameron would allow her time outside the box, but only at night. And when she was out, she could sense that Cameron and Janice's relationship was still damaged but changing. In front of Colleen, they began reading the Bible together to try to heal their marriage. And after their Bible sessions, they began having their private sessions where they would confess things to each other. But Colleen was there to witness. One night, Janice told Cameron that she had been cheating on him. And Cameron confessed that he was still raping Colleen during the torture sessions. Colleen noticed the rape suddenly stopped after this confession though. And then Janice began releasing Colleen from the box a few times every day. She would make her do chores, but then talk about the Bible. She even gave Colleen her own Bible to keep. By May 1984, Colleen was out of the box full time. They let her outside and even reintroduced her to the neighbors. Cameron wanted Colleen to get back to work at the local motel to make them some money. But the hooker's new obsession with religion also began affecting Colleen. Soon she was allowed to go to the first church of Nazarene, and Janice joined her. At one point, Janice tried confessing what was happening at her home, but she only described it as a love triangle to her pastor. She thought her faith would heal her marriage, but nothing changed. During their Bible sessions at home, Janice and Cameron interpreted the Bible in very different ways. Cameron thought the Bible reinforced his behavior and justified enslaving and raping Colleen. He thought he was allowed to have multiple wives that obeyed him without question. So he began raping Colleen again and he wanted Janice to join him. As for Janice, the Bible and her religion made her second guess her marriage and Colleen's enslavement. And after seven years of watching Cameron torture and rape Colleen, Janice finally felt guilty over what they were doing to this poor woman. After reflecting on her life, Janice was only 15 when she married Cameron and she was 17 by the time Cameron murdered Marliz, and for nine years she listened to every command Cameron gave her, and she knew he was capable of murder and torture. But over the years, Janice's mental health began to fall apart. Some believe she was in the middle of a spiritual crisis. She also realized that Colleen had become her closest friend and one of her only friends. They cared for each other when they were sick, went to church together and discussed the Bible. But Janice had put her best friend through so much abuse. Plus, her children were getting old enough to start understanding the truth of what was actually going on inside their home. The final straw was when Cameron came to Janice and told her he wanted more slaves. And Janice finally realized that Cameron saw her as a slave too. So one day in 1984, Janice came to Colleen while she was at work and told her that Cameron wasn't a member of the company. To make sure Colleen wouldn't go to the police, Janice told her the company was still real but Cameron wasn't a part of it. This half-truth was enough for Colleen to start seeing through Cameron's lies. Janice also said she was planning on taking the kids and leaving Cameron soon, but Colleen begged Janice not to leave her behind. So the next morning, they both waited for Cameron to leave for work. Then they packed a few things, took the girls, and went to Janice's parents' house. For a while, Janice and Colleen stayed with their parents. Janice wanted Colleen to stay and watch the children, but Colleen knew she needed to be free. She called her dad, who hadn't heard from her in three years, and he immediately wired her money for a bus ticket home to Riverside. Before getting on the bus, she called Cameron. She told him she knew he had lied to her all these years, and there was nothing he could do to stop her. After a short silence, she heard him crying and immediately hung up. He later described this as a hard goodbye from a woman he loved. Because of the intense psychological pain and manipulation over the last seven years, 
Colleen didn't talk to the police for months after her release. She told her family small details but never the whole picture, and she tried to secretly fade back into a normal life. As for Janice, Cameron kept begging for her to come home with the kids, and she eventually gave in, and he promised her that he would change. He'd give up bondage and slavery, and even started going to church with her. Over phone conversations, Janice even convinced Colleen that Cameron deserved a second chance, and once Colleen's family learned what really happened to her, they begged her to go to the police. She had promised Janice that she wouldn't. Even after everything, Colleen still was willing to give Cameron a second chance. In response, Colleen's cousins started making threatening phone calls to the hookers. Soon enough, Janice realized that Cameron would never truly change. He was a lost cause. Janice eventually went to the Church of Nazarene to confess her sins, and she confessed to the police after. She was granted immunity by the DA and told them everything she could remember, including Marliz, who Cameron had strangled to death back in 1976. After Janice's confession, police contacted Colleen, and she also gave her statement about what had happened. Colleen's story matched Janice's confession, and then they asked if Colleen knew anything about the previous victim, Marie Elizabeth Spanicky, or Marliz. She recognized the name but didn't know much, and she remembered Cameron had kept a picture of a young woman with him. When Colleen described the woman's appearance to police, they confirmed it was most likely Marliz in the photo. By now, police didn't have a body or any physical evidence in Marliz's case. All they had was Janice's testimony. Without her, there was no case. And without a body, it was almost impossible to charge and convict someone of murder. So they took Janice out to try and find Marliz's body. They searched east of Redding along Highway 44 and Highway 299. They checked for any roads off the right-hand side of the highways to see if Janice could pinpoint which road they took the body to, but she couldn't recognize the right one. Out near Redding, there was a lot of open country filled with trees. If Janice couldn't remember the exact road, it would be like trying to find a needle in a haystack. They took her on several trips out there, but they never found Marliz's body. Since they couldn't find her, the DA's office believed it could have been a mistake to pursue this case as a homicide. They would have risked losing the case if they tried to take Cameron Hooker to trial, and if they lost, they could never retry Cameron for the murder again. Cameron has since denied any involvement in the disappearance of Marie Elizabeth Spanicky. Even though they couldn't pin him for murder, they followed through the kidnapping case of Colleen Stan. Cameron was arrested on November 18, 1984 and charged with 17 counts of rape, kidnapping, sodomy, and false imprisonment. In 1985, he went to trial, and Colleen's case drew a lot of media attention, so the death of Marliz was only a side note. At one point, Tehama County was so broke, they considered offering Cameron a plea deal that would allow him to skip trial and serve a sentence where he could have been paroled within five years. But the DA reminded that a plea deal for a serious felony for anything other than lack of evidence was illegal. Cameron's trial lasted six weeks and the media packed the courtroom, and everyone watched in horror as the DA brought out the slavery contract, the head box, chains, handcuffs, leather whip, and a wooden box where they locked Colleen. Cameron had also taken pictures of Colleen naked and tied to the wooden table in his basement. A doctor had noted all of Colleen's scars on both of her wrists and one ankle and Cameron had also pierced her private parts and claimed that he was tagging her for the company. They also noted that Colleen had grown an inch in height from the medieval stretching torture device, and her hair was thinning. She had electrical burns on her thighs, and she had permanent eye damage after being locked in the pitch black box for years. The defense tried to argue that Colleen was often let out of the house, so she could have left at any time. But the DA brought in several hostage experts and psychologists to explain how Colleen was conditioned, programmed, and abused until she was locked with invisible chains. At one point, the DA wanted to introduce Marliz's story to the jury, but it was kept out because it was too prejudicial. This basically meant that Marliz's case would lead to an improper judgment because it was biased. Her case wasn't a murder committed by Cameron in the eyes of the law, technically. So it was still just a missing persons case, so they couldn't use her as an example in the courtroom. And the DA was even forbidden from mentioning Marliz at all during Colleen's trial. Wow, that's really surprising. But Cameron was later convicted on 10 counts, including kidnapping, rape, sodomy, and other sexual crimes. At the sentencing hearing, Judge Knight said, quote, 
I consider this defendant to be probably the most dangerous psychopath that I've ever dealt with. If for no other reason than he appears to be exactly the opposite of what he is, I feel you'll always be a danger to women as long as you're alive. After that, he sentenced Cameron to 104 years in prison. For the last couple of years, I've been taking advantage of all of the amazing services that Stamps.com offers. With my CBD business, Higher Love Wellness, as well as our merch store, MileHighMerch.com, we use Stamps.com to ship out all of our packages, buy all of our postage, and schedule those pickups every single day. And I got to say, Stamps.com has saved me thousands and thousands of dollars on postage. If you've ever been to the post office or the UPS store, you know how expensive the rates have gotten. But with Stamps.com, they give you exclusive discounts that you can't find anywhere else. They give you up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. So you save tons of money by using Stamps.com. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. What's great about Stamps.com is you get all of the functionality of the post office right from your home computer, your office, and all you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale, so you'll have everything you need to get started. If you need a package picked up, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. There's no driving to the post office anymore to drop it off. And if you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping carts. Set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code LIGHTSOUT. That's all one word for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a free digital scale. And there's no long-term commitments or contracts, so give it a try. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code LIGHTSOUT. Colleen's case was finally over, but Mar Liz's case was still open, and no new information was coming in and police still hadn't found her body. So again, her case went cold. Which that leads us to the year 2000. 33-year-old Jody Foster and her three-year-old daughter Hannah moved into apartment 14 in the Walnut Gardens apartment complex on January 31st. Just as a side note, this woman is obviously not Jodie Foster, the actress. But they moved into the apartment exactly 24 years after Marliz vanished. Jody was a single mom and she had Hannah in 1997. She then moved to Chico because she thought it was a good place to raise a family. Jody had been apartment hunting when she spotted a for rent sign in front of the building. The complex looked nice enough and it had a pool and flowers outside. But the cheery exterior of the building didn't match the energy inside. Once they moved into apartment number 14, Jody sensed something dark inside the place. And she noticed a strange smell throughout the whole apartment. Jody tried to ignore her senses and she tried her best to stay positive and focus on starting a peaceful life with her daughter and Chico. But no matter how hard she tried, the negative energy kept seeping in. Then she began having a recurring nightmare of a dark dungeon. Only one light was on inside the dark room and she could see one young woman and a creepy couple nearby. At first these dreams were very vague and blurry, but over time they got more vivid and terrifying. Eventually, she woke up in terror, covered in sweat. In this reoccurring nightmare, the young woman had auburn hair and she could see her walking down the streets of Chico. Then she envisioned a blue car pulling up to the young woman. The couple inside offered the young woman a ride. The man approached the girl from behind before putting something over her mouth. Eventually, Jody could see the exact location where they took her. It looked like a house from the outside, but inside. There was a downstairs and a dark root cellar or a dungeon. As the visions got more detailed, she could see a big hook attached to the ceiling. It looked like a hook used for lifting logs. And the young woman was eventually hanging by that hook. Her arms were tied up and there was something around her mouth. As her reoccurring nightmares continued, Jody could see that the couple was subjecting the girl to brutal sexual abuse. Things got even stranger outside of Jody's dreams. When her young daughter Hannah had started talking to someone inside the apartment, from another room, Jody could hear her daughter saying, Hi. And when Jody asked her daughter who she was talking to, Hannah pointed and said, That girl right there. Jody asked her daughter if someone had walked by the window, but Hannah said no, she was talking to that girl right there. And Hannah said she was wearing a white shirt, and she could see her face and hair so vividly. It wasn't like the rough silhouette of an apparition. It looked like a real person in the flesh, but Jody couldn't see her. Hannah eventually gave the girl a name, My Liz. 
To her, it was just another little girl that dropped by the apartment every once in a while because she wanted a friend. And Jody began to believe that her daughter could somehow access the same paranormal energies, just like her. It wasn't long before these supernatural entities began affecting the physical world. Jody had always kept Hannah's pink sneakers near the apartment's front door. But one day she was trying to get Hannah ready for school when she noticed that her sneakers weren't in their usual spot. And when she looked around, she found the sneakers sitting neatly in the middle of Hannah's bed. Jody asked her daughter if she had put the shoes there herself, and Hannah said no. At first, Jody shrugged it off. No, maybe Hannah wasn't telling the truth, but the shoes kept moving, and they would always be in the same spot, sitting in the center of Hannah's bed. Every time Hannah swore that she hadn't moved the shoes, she insisted to her mother over and over again that she never touched them. Besides the shoes, more weird things kept happening in the apartment. Jody would find random items had moved from their normal spot without any real explanation. Her salt and pepper shakers at one end of her kitchen table would move to the opposite end. Other times, the entity affected the electronics inside the apartment. There was a corded phone attached to one of the walls, and one night Jody and Hannah went out to dinner. When they came back, Jody noticed the receiver and the cord were missing. When she went into the back bedroom, she found the receiver disconnected from the wall. She also saw that Hannah's toys had all been placed into a big pile. On top of the pile, Jody noticed Hannah's stuffed sleep and snore Ernie doll. And there was a noose tied around his neck made out of a shoestring. Jody panicked and immediately grabbed her daughter before running out the front door. Jody then called the Chico police and reported that her apartment had been broken into. She described the eerie scene she had found inside, but the police didn't seem to believe her story. Finally, everything came to a head one night in February 2000. Jody woke up and heard a strange, staticky buzzing noise coming from the living room. She went to investigate and found that the TV was on, showing nothing but static. Hannah was in her bedroom, so Jody had no idea how the TV was on. Then Jody looked over at the kitchen and noticed that the gas burner was on and set to high, and the cabinet doors had started to open and close on their own. But what truly spooked her was what she heard next. Coming from Hannah's closet, was the sound of Hannah's sleep and snore Ernie doll. The toy had a little button that played a pre-recorded noise when you pressed it. The noise maker was said to play different sounds when it was activated, including the phrase, I feel great. I feel great. And the song Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So while the TV was buzzing, the burner was set to high, and all the cabinet doors were flapping, Jody heard Ernie over and over say, At first, Jody thought the toy's batteries were dying or malfunctioning, so she grabbed the toy off the shelf and ripped them out. Once they were out, Jody put the toy back in the closet and thought it would stop. But then Jody and Hannah both heard Ernie's eerie voice again, and the toy began singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and repeating, I feel great. I feel great. Then suddenly, all the lights began flickering. At this point, Jody was panicking. So she ran down the hall to her neighbor's apartment where the apartment complex's manager lived. Jody told her that something was very wrong inside apartment 14. So the manager grabbed her poodle and investigated the issue herself. Once she got inside, her dog immediately jumped out of her arms and started barking like crazy. Then one of the cords on a lamp started to swing in the air like a jump rope. In the bedroom, the doll was still talking. I feel great. I feel great. The cupboards were still flapping. The stove was still burning and the lights were all on, and the dog was clearly barking at some invisible force. By this point, they had seen enough, so Jody grabbed her daughter, the manager grabbed her dog, and they all left apartment 14. Around 6 o'clock that morning, Jody was sitting by the pool sobbing and trying to make sense of what she had just witnessed. That's when one of her neighbors passed by while he was walking his dog. He was an older man who had lived in the apartment complex for about 25 years, and he noticed Jody crying, so he went over to her. He then told her that nobody who moved into apartment 14 ever stayed there that long. At first, it seemed like he struggled to explain why, but Jody begged him to tell her. Eventually, the man told her a young woman used to live in apartment 14, who had gone missing shortly after moving in with her boyfriend. The neighbor couldn't remember her name, but he knew that after she went missing, nobody had seen or heard from her since. After only living at the Walnut Gardens for a few months, Jody had finally had enough. She didn't feel like her daughter was safe, so they packed up and moved to a different place in Chico. 
and once they were finally out, Jody thought the nightmare was over. She eventually started dating a new guy, and one day her boyfriend came across a book titled Perfect Victim, The True Story of the Girl in the Box by Christine McGuire and Carla Norton. The book was about the story of Colleen Stan and her seven years of captivity. When Jody's boyfriend read the book, he was shocked. A part of the book was about one of Janice and Cameron's victims, a girl named Marla Spanicky. The description of Marla's disappearance matched the stories in Jody's vivid nightmares back in apartment 14. Her boyfriend even showed her an article about the girl's disappearance. And when Jody connected the dots, she remembered that Hannah had called the little girl in apartment 14, my Liz, which sounded just like my Liz. She asked Hannah if she still remembered my Liz. Hannah said she did. And Jody showed her a picture of my Liz. And Hannah said she looked just like the little girl she had seen in apartment 14. Jody believed the paranormal activity was caused by the spirit of Marliz in a desperate attempt to solve her case. Jody hadn't experienced anything paranormal since she had moved out of apartment 14, but she eventually began having vivid nightmares again. The strange couple returned. The man was extremely tall and the woman was short. It was around dusk and they were stalking someone or looking for someone. Then Jody would begin flying in her dream and hear the number 35.76. She would then see a capital A in the number 17. Her first thought was that this had to do with a specific location. She thought Marliz was trying to communicate with her. So in 2008, she called the Red Bluff Police Department and told them she might have information on Marliz's murder. The other end of the line was silent and Jody thought they hung up on her. But then Detective Kevin Hale told her they were currently reopening the case of Marie Elizabeth Spanicky, and he was disturbed that she had mentioned the case without the public knowing that they were reopening it. Kevin later met up with Jody and asked her for a long list of questions about her dreams. Kevin was skeptical about the dreams at first, and he couldn't confirm or deny anything about the case, but he thought Jody's dreams were worth pursuing, and when she explained the number 35.76, Jody told Kevin she believed that that number had something to do with the distance between the house where Marlowe's was murdered and her burial site. She also believed it was a northwest direction from the house, and the number 17 in the capital A, she told him, she believed might be the road that led to the burial site. And sure enough, there was a road that connected Highway 44 called A-17. Police then contacted Janice Hooker again in 2010. At the time, she was living in Chico under a different name. They reminded her that she still had an immunity agreement and they weren't going to arrest her. Then they asked her again what type of road they had turned down off Highway 44. This time she gave them a better description. She mentioned some structures they had passed the night they buried Marliz. So police headed back out after narrowing the search down to a smaller area this time. After using mapping software, they realized that the distance between the house and the potential burial site was 35.77 miles. Jody had given them the number 35.76. And all of the descriptions Janice gave police were on that road. Unfortunately to this day though, Marliz's body has never been found. Red Bluff still has a case open as a homicide, and Chico has it open as a missing persons case. But as for Cameron Hooker, he was denied parole in 2015. He was later granted parole in March 2021 at the age of 68. The reasoning behind this is that sex offenders who are older don't reoffend as much because they're not as strong as they used to be. But because of the backlash to his parole, he was temporarily labeled as a sexually violent predator and kept behind bars. His trial was set to begin April 18th of this year, 2023, according to Tehama County DA's office. If the trial determines he is a sexually violent predator, he could potentially be sent to a mental health facility indefinitely and be ineligible for parole. If not, he could be released on parole under certain conditions. As for Jody Foster, she still lives in Chico as a digital creator. She's written a book called Forgotten Burial, A Restless Spirit's Plea for Justice, that details her paranormal experiences with these cases. Her daughter Hannah lives in California and is currently raising her daughter Marilyn. As for Colleen Stan, she has since changed her name and supposedly lives somewhere in Northern California. In 2009, she published a book about her experiences called The Simple Gifts of Life. After the trial, she returned to live with her family and had a few goals in mind. She pursued an accounting degree and also worked as an office manager. She later told the newspapers that she suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder 
and experiences residual physical pain. She has had several failed marriages and cannot hold a job in the aftermath of the kidnapping and torture she endured. In recent years, her priority has been raising her grandchildren. Colleen once said, quote, I learned I could go anywhere in my mind. You just remove yourself from the real situation going on and you can go somewhere else. You go somewhere pleasant around people you love, whatever makes you happy. Your life is just kind of in limbo when you're in captivity. And once you get that freedom back and you have that choice again, it's just like the gates have opened and you just run for it. Wow. It's amazing that she's been able to bring some normalcy back to her life. That's my favorite part about this case is that the woman who went through all this still has some positivity and a decent outlook on everything. But man, I can't even imagine the PTSD and yeah. the dream she must have and just that is so much to overcome mentally. Yeah. I couldn't imagine, honestly. Seven years too. It's it's a literal real life horror movie. It's not a movie, it's real life, but it's like it's crazy. It's like some of the things that he did I've only heard of or seen in horror movies before, let alone heard about happening in real life. So right. it's just like it's it's crazy what what he put her through and the fact that he may you know get released and that they're trying to figure out if he's still a violent sexual predator is like crazy to me it's like clearly he is i mean he's been doing this since he's 19 years old right and uh they said there was some connection with her and how she talked about how in her mind she would just go to certain places and that's apparently what pow's do in war when you're just in prison going through the worst shit you kind of just learn how to take your mind to a pleasant place. I'd imagine prisoners too, just like in people in prison. Right. Yeah. Especially those that are in like solitary confinement and stuff. Like I think just anytime you're in captivity or like locked somewhere in order to keep yourself from absolutely going insane, you have to develop the skill of like going outside of your body almost and allowing your mind to, travel somewhere else to just deal with the, the physical reality yeah, i remember uh kurt vonnegut's slaughterhouse five he talks about because he was a pow he talks about just remembering his elementary school uh classroom and just remembering the names of the students that's like what kind of what he, he would go through just like try and remember everyone there and take himself to a different place so it's she kind of did learned naturally how to do the same thing but yeah, if this guy, I don't, how, I would lose so much faith in everything if this guy is set free. I would too. It's, it's, this guy needs to be in prison forever. I mean, he is a dangerous, dangerous individual and he's been at this for so long. I don't think there, there is no changing your life. You know, the fact that he was like, oh, trying to, you know, going to church and everything, trying to, you know, the classic, like you know turning it around you know after all this horrible stuff is like it's just i don't see it i don't see it working for him do you think uh granting janice immunity was a good call i think so i i think yeah i mean she went through her own torture as well yeah and i mean obviously she i guess was an accomplice to all of this it was like against her will right like and you know she was brainwashed and yeah i I think that was the right call because ultimately cameron is the is the main culprit here it's just a shame that they haven't been able to connect you know connect him to marla's murder yeah in order to charge him because obviously that would put him away and i get why they didn't pursue it because they're like if we screw up this trial then we'll never be able to try him again. And I think they're banking on finding the, those remains somehow. Yeah. Which, which leads to the question of Jody and it's interesting. It's like, I'm trying to really wrap my head around her story because it seems like based on what I've heard her say is that she's always kind of had this like 
is a very empathic person who kind of is able to tap into, you know, these other energies in the paranormal kind of world. Because, I mean, to have dreams like that where it's almost like showing you flashbacks of something you've never, you know, you've never experienced firsthand, but you're seeing somebody else's memories perhaps is, is a very interesting skill like whether it was just kind of this anomaly that happened or if this is something that she's just kind of this inherent ability almost like a clairvoyant or something it is very interesting to me and that she was actually able to pull some information that was actually accurate to the case and the fact that her daughter was seeing you know the spirit perhaps of of mar liz and was literally saying my liz i mean that's pretty close. Yeah. I, I think I think this is one of those situations where she was maybe actually interacting with the spirit or residual energy, whatever it is, of Mar Liz in that apartment. Cause like, you know, we've covered it many times that when so, you know somebody is experiences a horrific death and there's all this you know hatred and anger around it i mean it's like you know somebody's like basically robbed of their life that part of them may you know may stay on this side of the of of, i guess the physical realm and the spiritual realm and they're not able to completely move over because they still feel like there's something they need to accomplish or something i mean there's so many different ways you can look at it but it seems like in this case, that's maybe what Marla's, if that is her spirit, that's what it's trying to do, is trying to get justice for herself, which is which is so interesting. So the concept itself of like, you know, if you're murdered and nothing ever comes of it, do you, you know, does, do you have the choice or the ability to stay on this side? Yeah. In order to try and kind of like get closure from your your life here on earth i know it's kind of a controversial topic but i don't know have we ever covered any cases where we the uh true crime where they've used mediums clairvoyance and whatnot because i know there are cases out there where they have used them and in this case jody kind of reminds me of that kind of the someone yeah. sensing something and helping police piece together things i mean i think there's de- there i don't know that we've covered anything specifically on that because a lot of times unfortunately it, there's absolutely nothing that comes of it. I mean, obviously, it's an opportunity for somebody who claims they're a medium or clairvoyant to get paid, right? right. Like, utilize me for a service, and but I'm not going to guarantee anything from it. And a lot of a lot of times, you know, I've covered cases in the past where they actually make it worse oh, and really? send and send the investigation into a wild goose chase that doesn't end up going anywhere or ends up being harmful to the victims in the end but i know like the fbi even has used mediums before like there's definitely cases over the years of of bringing in psychics in order to try and help solve cases i'm sure there's other cases similar to this where some information was able to be derived from the the medium or clairvoyant person in order to further the investigation in a positive direction so maybe that's something we should explore yeah and if anybody out there has a particular case where you know, something positive came from psychics and mediums being involved in a, in a, in a case or investigation, let us know. Cause that's my only thing is like nine times out of 10, I feel like it's not a helpful yeah. situation or yeah. it's just a complete scam where they're just like, cause that's the thing is like, there's a lot of, of cases where families, especially in missing persons cases, like it comes to a complete dead end and it's cold at that point. It's like, why not try, right? Why not at least see, if any information can be derived from somebody right. who's psychic, but I mean, every time I've seen it, it's like just been a scam basically and nothing comes of it or, or you give, or you give the family some information that's like harmful or maybe a lot of, some even make crazy accusations like that end up like pointing at the family itself oh, it's being like involved. The dad did it yeah, or exa- exactly. Yeah. Stuff like that. And it's just like, it's, it ends up spiraling the case in a, in a, negative direction that didn't need to happen in the first place and, yeah. and that's I mean, the, that's the hard part of it is like there's no way to like measure like you can't be like are you a 
certified medium. You yeah. Know, there's no way to prove know. it. It's yeah. just like all, you know, there's no way to measure that ability. Yeah. That's so, why, at least in this case, as far as I know, she wasn't seeking any financial gain. No. Oh. So she was just basically contacting police because she believed that she was gleaning some information from her dreams. So I thought that was kind of cool. Just like, Hey, this is a case that's been going on for a long time and it's not gone anywhere. So might as well just reach out and give them some information. Right. Can't hurt. And I mean, again, the, she got the apartment manager in there and witnessed the paranormal activity in there. Yeah. And so it's like, obviously some people are like, well, she could just made it all up, you know, like it just all be made up and it could be, but the fact that she did get some specific information that is very, very close to actual information in, in Marlis's case is, is pretty wild. I mean, that's a, be a pretty big coincidence if she just like randomly guessed that, and, you know, my Liz, I'm, Hannah was saying my Liz and you know, the, the distance, the, the number is like off by like point one like, yeah. at, or point oh one. Like that's, that's pretty close. So, yeah. I mean, I think there was something legitimate to this, this particular case. So yeah, man, what a, I'm just like trying to like, process everything because it's like there's so big much one, i mean yeah. it's like mar liz's case is just its whole thing and then you've got cameron and janice and then you've got col col and then you've got colleen it's just like there's three different storylines you have to kind of all put together but i mean ultimately it comes back to this monster that is cameron hooker yeah and Oh, I hope he stays in prison. He, he's a dangerous individual. Yeah, we'll we'll try and keep updated yeah. on on that case. And where yeah, because that's, that's going. going on currently. So yeah. yeah, we'll definitely put something out on social media once we know more about that. But that is going to be it for us today. Let us know your thoughts if you're watching on YouTube, uh, which we do live premieres every Friday at twelve thirty Mountain Standard Time. Join us. There's a live chat going on. Um, it's always good to hear your guys' thoughts in real time and interact with us. Uh, during the premiere of the episode. Uh, but yeah, that is it for us today. We'll see you guys next week with another dark one. Until then, lights out, everybody. <laughs>